Hi everybody, this is Neil from Simply Music. Uh, I'm really excited to introduce you to a, a, a man who I just absolutely love. This is a beautiful, special and remarkable human being. Uh, Tim Ringgold. Hey buddy. Hi, thanks for having me, Neil. Yeah, good to see you, man. Likewise. Yeah, uh, I've known Tim for, I don't know, some, some years now. We're both a part of a couple of entrepreneurial groups, but we met through a mutual friend, Joe Polish, and we're both a part of the Genius Network. Uh, Tim's a, a music therapist. Uh, first and foremost, uh, he's an extraordinary man, and I want to introduce you all to Tim and talk about what he's up to. But I'd also like to take a few moments just to talk uh, a little bit with Tim about uh, his background and sort of like, how did you get here? And so, um, Tim, uh, your first vocal solo was at four years of age. That is correct. <laughs> Do you still remember the song? I think it was, I want a harmonica for Hanukkah. That is also correct, Neil. You're blowing my mind right now because your memory is better than mine. Sing it for me. Uh, I could play a trumpet, but that's just not right for me. <laughs> I could play a saxophone, but I would rather be. And then we go into I, the... I, I believe. That's fantastic. <laughs> um, so good. Did you get to sing for the Pope? I did. I did. How did that come about? Uh, I was 16. I was a junior in high school. I went to a, a Jesuit school in Connecticut called Fairfield Prep. Yeah. And uh, the Jesuit general, head of the Jesuit church, came and sang at our school. No, he came to our school and we sang for him. He loved it. Our choir was doing a tour to Italy the next year. So he arranged for us to be uh, one of the choirs that sing at the papal audience every Wednesday in St. Peter's Square. Mm -hmm. He lined it up for us. And um, in our choir, I was the soloist. Uh, I was a bass and still am. And I sang every time I, I feel the spirit. Uh, in St. Peter's Square, there was about 13,000 Catholic pilgrims that day. And uh, His Holiness John Paul II. And I grew up Catholic. Uh, I don't mm -hmm. practice uh, Catholicism anymore. But at the time, I was you know, deep into it. And uh, yeah. my mom was the director of religious education at our local mm -hmm. parish. Mm -hmm. um, and I was even given a scholarship to go uh, because we couldn't afford it. But the school really wanted my voice to represent. And so uh, what was beautiful about that, Neil, was I used to be a tenor, like most boys, right? I started soprano and then I was a second tenor and was a soloist. And then I hit puberty and all my solos went away because, you know, tenors get the solos, right? So I became this tuba, you mm. know, as a bass, just singing one, five, one, yeah, right. one. Yeah. And, and I was really crushed. But the irony was that the solo that was sung for St. Peter was, or for Pope John Paul, was a bass solo. And if I hadn't had that happen, mm. it wouldn't have been me there that day. Mm. So I was really grateful in hindsight to the way that that all worked out. Right. So you go from that to then into rock and roll guitar. Of course. What's, what's the obvious segue from growing up in a tight religious family? It's go heavy metal. So uh, rebel and go the opposite direction, right? And um, stop singing and started playing guitar and playing really, really heavy, really angry, uh, as heavy as it gets, as dark as it gets. And, mm. and a lot of, um, of that repression, that spirit, like religious repression early on in my life kind of bubbled up sexually and musically and through drugs and you know just kind of exploding in different directions but i found a home in music with other disaffected kids and teens like who didn't have a relationship with family didn't have a relationship with faith only had their friends and my band wrote like music that was dark but it had a spiritual focus to it because we wanted kids to know hey listen if you want to have some sort of spiritual relationship you don't need a middleman if that's not right for you if you want to just have your own one-on-one -on -one relationship with something bigger than you, you can access that and you can do it through music. And mm -hmm. so sure enough, even through doing super heavy music, we were still kind of creating this deep connection for kids. And it was really inspiring because I was working with kids who were goth and industrial right around when Columbine tragedy happened. And, you know, that whole community was getting, you know, beat on because of the actions of a couple of people. And I got to really minister uh, to kids. And one kid told me straight up, he's like, bro, you saved my life. And I was like, what are you talking about? He goes, I got hooked on meth. 
I, I got depressed. I got suicidal. The night I was going to kill myself, I was in my room and your CD came on my CD changer. And I thought of you and Eddie, our singer, and he goes, I just thought of how sad you guys would be if I killed myself. And in that moment, I just decided not to. Mm. And so even through playing just the heaviest music, I found that I could still, you know, music is that bridge, right? And I could be with this poor kid in the darkest moment in his bedroom by himself. I was there through the music. It's one of those things, um, you know, when I when I think about my own experience with music, as well as uh, all of our educators, we truly have no idea who we're going to impact, how we're going to impact them, and what impact that's going to have. We just have yes. no idea. No idea. Hmm. No. And that's what's remarkable when you hear the stories, right? When you get the feedback and hmm. you're just like, thank you, hmm. because I've been putting this out there and building this connection and I have no idea you know, how it is for you over there. So when you hear those stories, I was so grateful that boy came up and told me that story. Yeah, well, and uh, you were still playing some pretty um, high profile gigs as well uh, in that environment. <clears throat> Pursued that through your 20s. And then 30, the shift to training as a music therapist. What, where's that come from? You know, um, I had been in the music industry for several years at that point. It's a brutal industry to try to make it in, particularly as a, in, in heavy, heavy music, what's not radio friendly. My wife and I were engaged and um, we were reading one of those cute books that people give you about, you know, what to expect when you're going to get married. And it had like, you know, what do you see yourself doing in five, 10, 20 years from now in your career? And my wife had her MBA and she could see like director, like pie charts and graphs and, you know, the corporate path and i just saw the black hole of the music industry and i was just like ah oh. <laughs> and she said you know if you want to go back to school we can afford it um i think i was like 31 maybe i don't know late or right around 31 32 at the time and i thought you know man i'm going to be working as long as i've been alive so I probably should, you know, really pick something that I love that's going to be sustainable because the music industry was definitely financially not sustainable, uh, health not sustainable, spiritually not sustainable. So I just went on to Arizona State University's website because that was the local university near where I lived. And I just scrolled through their index of majors from A to Z just to see if there was anything that would resonate. Mm. And I stumbled upon the two words music therapy. Mm. I'd never heard them before. And I'm an athlete as well as an artist. So I used to actually work in physical therapy and I loved it, but it was just tissue. It was skin deep. It didn't touch the emotions and the soul. So when I saw music therapy and that I could treat and heal people with music as a modality, in that moment, I filled out my online application and my FAFSA and my whole life changed from yeah. that very moment. And I never looked back. Mm. So... There's a bunch of things I want to talk about with regards to that and, uh, and how it's manifesting and what things you're working on and what you're up to. But I also just want to touch on, you've had some complexities in your past. You've talked a, a bit about where you're at in the trajectory getting into heavy metal and you know the darkness of that. Yeah. I very much think it has a place, you know, genrely. But separate from that, um, you lost your father, you lost some, you lost some friends. Yeah, so the big one of the big turning points for me about the power of music was that in 1995, my five best friends were murdered. And it was the night before the Oklahoma City bombing, which a lot of people remember back. So try to imagine I'm, I'm 20, uh, I don't know, doesn't matter, uh, 22. And I turn on the TV and on the radio, the major channels, there's the Oklahoma Federal Building. And on the local channel is my, the house my best friends rented that my band practiced in every Wednesday, burned to the ground, and they're pulling body bags out of the house. But only three guys lived there, and they pulled out five bags, which meant two more of our friends died that night. And this is before internet, before texting. None of us knew who the other two were. So in one night, I lost... There were eight of us that were a really core group of people and I lost five of them uh, in one night. And I, what happened was I ended up singing a song at all their funerals to say goodbye. And my whole community and my friends and my family were, and the, you know, would all come up and say how 
healing that was for them. And then the night of the last funeral, I went to a concert. And for the first two hours since I had gotten the news, I was at peace. And, and no amount of drugs or alcohol or porn or TV, nothing had done that up until that point. And believe me, I tried all week to numb that pain and nothing worked. But it was seeing Steve Morse at Tuxedo Junction on this Tuesday night. Oh. That was the first time I was at peace. And in that moment, I got what everyone was telling me when I was playing at their funerals, like what it was doing for them, now Steve Morse was doing for me. Mm. And it, it came like full circle. And, and like, that's when I realized the purpose of my life is to heal other people with music. Mm. Thank you for that. Tim, tell us about your beautiful daughter, Bella. Sure. Yeah, Bella, uh, thank you for asking about Bella. Um, my wife uh, gave birth to our second daughter, Bella. She was born in 2009 and died in 2010 from a rare fatal childhood disease called epidermal lysis bullosa or ED. It's a really weird disease where your skin, uh, there's your body produces one single protein that acts like Velcro that holds your skin to itself and to the body. And with ED, the body doesn't make that protein. So the skin essentially is floating on the body and on itself. And if you bump it or just rub into it, it'll just separate or peel right off. And so you get these crazy blisters all over or these giant open wounds. And it was totally undiagnosed in the womb. We had no idea. When she came out, she had no skin from her knee to her ankle. And where the doctors had gripped her with their latex gloves, all the skin had peeled off like butter. And uh, we were totally unprepared for this. And uh, within minutes, I found myself in a hallway walking her in an isolate, one of those plastic boxes going to the neonatal intensive care unit. And uh, because she had a skin disease, you couldn't touch her. So, uh, but, but her ears worked. Right. And so we had already prepared a birth song for her. She already knew her birth song. Uh, I had played classical guitar every night to the womb for a month straight while mom read goodnight stories to Bella's older sister. So I went back to my wife's uh, recovery room and I recorded her reading the stories while I played the same program of music. And then I put those plus her birth song on my iPod and then took a little uh, tiny speaker and placed the iPod behind her head in her isolate so she could hear the music that she listened to every night and she could hear mommy's voice while she was in this plastic box, literally in a different hospital. And so from the moment she was born, I was able to lean on my skills as a music therapist to help keep the presence, you know, like the presence of mommy and daddy with her, even though physically we couldn't be there. And every time we had to change her bandages, every single time, which was every day or every other day, which is an incredibly painful procedure for the kid and incredibly stressful for the parents. We used music every single time and it calmed my wife and I down, which of course then calmed our daughter down because she's looking up at us, feeding off of our energy for you know emotions. And then it also distracted her because music's a very powerful distraction agent. And so our wound care sessions, Neil, like, I hear the worst stories from families of what it's like to change bandages. And in my family, it was so peaceful and it was so tranquil and like these sacred moments between Bella and my wife and I, and the music was, you know, did it all. I, I, didn't, I can't even really imagine what this must have been like for you. And and uh, every time I've ever touched on any conversation or heard you speak of Bella, she's um, she's still so alive. Thank you. And quickly, Bella socks. Oh yeah. So while she was, thank you. Um, while she was in the hospital, so she went through a, a bone marrow transplant to try to save her. Went horribly wrong. Everything that could have gone wrong did. We ended up in the ICU again for like three months. It's a 10 by 10 room with like machines everywhere. And I'm in there with her like 14 hours a day. 
And she couldn't wear any clothes because she literally just had tubes coming out of everywhere. And all she could wear was a diaper and socks. And so what we would do to try to normalize her life is we would put on fabulous, crazy socks that were just, you know, little infant socks. And, uh, and then every time we'd change them, I would take a little side shot of them and I would put them out on the blog. And because she was part of a clinical trial to f- try to find a cure, people were following her patient story all over the world through my blog. And so after a while, what happened was people started mailing us crazy, cute, fabulous baby socks from all around the world. And now in our living room, we have a little like Charlie Brown Christmas tree, uh, but instead of Christmas ornaments, it has Bella socks. And let's see if I can do this without hurting myself. Every time. Every time I see you, there's crazy socks, fabulous socks. Right. So today I'm wearing guitars and basses, basses and uh, this, let me just say like, so that's how I take her with me. But I've been wearing nutty socks since 2010 and fun socks did not, were not cool <laughs> in 2010. So I would have to go to like the dollar spot at Target, buy kid socks that like came right up to my ankle. I'd go to Payless shoes and buy girl, like teens, like knee highs. Like I was having to really get creative to wear fabulous socks. And then at some point, it got popular and I knew that the socks had jumped the shark when I was at like Nordstrom rack and there's like a Nordstrom level sock and it's goofy. And I'm like, okay, that's it. Everybody's now <laughs> crazy sock wagon train, but that's good. I was there in the beginning. Mm-hmm. Thanks for telling us about that. Thank you for asking. You work as a music therapist. I, I know that it's um, a, a fairly diverse and very comprehensive contribution that you've made. Uh, I also know you've had the opportunity to focus in, uh, in specific arenas like with uh, autism spectrum and learning differences and Alzheimer's and cancer. But um, particularly given your relationship with your own past and the great, great, great many people out there who are struggling with all sorts of complex addictions, so many of which remain hidden and secret and, um, you know, that's the silent sufferers. Uh, tell us a little bit now about what you're up to and what you're doing. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, music therapy is extremely broad. We work, you know, with patients across the lifespan. So we can work with preterm infants uh, all the way through early, you know, early childhood, school age years, adolescents, adults, uh, cancer, which is typically like middle-aged 50s, 60s is where our our main uh, cancer sufferers are, uh, all the way into working with uh, uh, elderly with uh, hospice or Alzheimer's or dementia, because music activates so many powerful pathways in the brain to produce really powerful effects on the body when used properly and in a targeted way. So depending on what a person is struggling with, we might apply music in a particular way for that person, for their challenges, to unlock some sort of goal to help them in their life in some way. So it's, ne- it's, it's an incredibly broad toolkit. We use it, you know, it's, it's I remember uh, early on being like, well, what does it look like? And my professors would say, well, it depends, which would drive me nuts early on. I wanted like simple, this, that, this, that. And because the human experience is so diverse and so complex and our relationship with music is so personal and subjective that it's really hard to standardize music. You can standardize like tempo, like a a click track because there's no subjective aesthetic involved in a click, right? But once we organize the sound into music, there's some level of subjective aesthetic experience happening, right? So for one teenager, listening to hip hop is exactly indicated for what they're going through, right? And for one um, middle-aged person listening to classic rock is exactly what they need to be doing. And then for an elderly person with dementia, playing a drum or shaking a shaker while listening to some golden oldies is exactly what they need. Mm -hmm. And for a preterm infant who's learning how to suck, swallow and breathe, sucking on a pacifier that plays lullaby music in their isolate as a contingent reinforcement to get them to develop their uh, sucking reflex so that they can 
feed orally and then discharge, that's what they need. So it's an incredibly amazing, broad um, way to practice. So like if you have a lot of, if you're like me and you like a lot of different things, music therapy is great because you can practice with music in so many different settings. Um, where I've kind of set up shop now is working with teens and adults who are struggling with what we would just call a constellation of mental health issues because it's, it's anxiety, it's trauma, it's depression, it's self-harm, it might be disordered or dysregulated eating, but it's also substance abuse and behavioral addiction because everybody reaches for something when they get stressed. The, it's just the way the brain's designed is that when the brain stre gets stressed, it triggers like a craving for something to self-soothe. So babies start by reaching for their thumb. When they get stressed, they attempt to self-soothe and we just go through life exploring the world around us, trying to calm this thing down when it gets upset. And the problem is that there's a lot of things in our culture that work really well, really well in the present moment and cause a hot mess in the future. And the biggest culprit is this. You know, some of the most well, you know, like smartest brains on, in our country are working day after day to figure out how to turn this into a slot machine. And so this thing is activating on our brain exactly the same way as a Vegas slot machine does. Uh, preying upon the same kind of intermittent reinforcement, dopamine hits. And so we're, we're all getting hooked on screens at a level just, you know, on, on just not seen before. And it might be drugs, might be alcohol, might be food, might be sex, might be money, might be work. But screens are, are really the, the culprit of the, the day. And here's how you know it. Because people will talk about binge watching on Netflix like it's normal. But if the person said they were, talk, they were talking about binge eating or binge drinking, we'd all be worried about them. Like, are, are you okay? Like, you don't need to, like, because binging is a verb. That's like a diagnostic criteria for something that's going on. And in our modern culture, we're really struggling with, you know, binge watching. And so what, what I'm really been working on, and that's what my book is about. Hold on. Ah, can't resist the moment to, you know, plug the book here. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so the book is called Sonic Recovery, Harness the Power of Music to Stay Sober. And sober is an acronym. And it stands for stay present, open up, be creative, escape stress, and reconnect. And those are the outcomes that when we engage with music, whether we make it or we listen to it or we write it or we <clears throat> relax to it, those are the outcomes that are possible. So that with time, when we get stressed, we learn to reach for music instead of digital sub distractions or harmful substances. Mm. Yeah, fabulous. You know, one of the things that part of the correlation that I see here and one of the things that I think is uh, part of the blessing of our program is the ability to have people connect to their natural musicianship and be able to have that musical self-expression as uh, as a, a, a critical companion. You know, I, I consider it to be critical neurological nutrition apart from the emotional and spiritual and psychological and you know, personal benefits. Yes. I think we share the view that all human beings are musical. Yes. Yep. That's, you know, I, I, I'm typically on the road about 20 weeks a year speaking to programs, conferences, retreats, and workshops. And I start with, and you've seen this, I start my talks with egg shakers. I don't talk. I just, everybody gets an egg shaker in the audience and I just walk up on stage and I just start shaking. And of course, within four beats, whether it's 2, 20, 80, 800, everybody's connected into one rhythm because they are a walking, talking rhythm machine and they have this cultural myth that, you know, music is knowledge and talent and all these things that are just, you know, they're cultural myths. And so it's very important for me and this is why our, we, our love for each other is that I feel this responsibility to dispel these myths with people so that it empowers them to reach inside and access the music that's already there. Because we all walk in rhythm, we scratch in rhythm, we talk in rhythm. Mm. So you can't miss it, you can't escape it. It's just letting it out in some way that works for you. And that's why your method is so amazing because it, it lowers the, the hurdle 
mm-hmm. for tapping into that because the other myth is that learning how to make music is hard, expensive, and time consuming. Mm-hmm. And you've really done an amazing job of being able to lower that ramp and say, not as hard as you think. Yeah, right. Latest project. Yeah, so uh, Reach for Music is a uh, membership program that we've created. And it started because in the book, uh, I issue a 40 days of play challenge at the end of the book. So just play with music 10 minutes a day for 40 days and just either make it, listen to it, write it or relax to it. Don't care which one, don't care how long, just 10 minutes. See what happens. Mm. Well, the results were amazing. And every year we give away a grand prize of a $2,000 shopping spree for the musical instruments of the winner's choice. So we gave away our first grand prize in December. Everybody, you know, we had all these applications come in and we got to read all this feedback from just having a little bit of structure and having accountability and community because we ran it through a Facebook group people who had been playing their instruments and then stopping because they got busy with career and family, picking up their instrument again for themselves and just jamming, not to make it as a musician, just jamming. Or because I'm a music therapist, a lot of my colleagues are music educators and music therapists. We all work music during the day. And many of them had stopped playing for themselves because they were so busy working music for others. Yeah, very common. Right. So they, they kind of get burnt out, right? Well, what they got burnt out as the context because it's, they're looking at it through the lens of work and they just forgot it's just, and they just needed a little structure, a little accountability and, and community to say, play for you. It's okay. You, you deserve it. And to hear the stories, particularly of my fellow colleagues who had been, they were like, I was starving mm. or I would like, they used phrases like I was so thirsty. I was parched. I was starving. These like words that kind of describe being empty. Yes. Um, their their own music tank had been empty for so long. Yes. yes. So so we were like, well, we need to do this ongoingly. So now uh, we're launching Reach for Music, and it's a program. It's only for successful professionals who are dealing with professional stress and home stress. And it's not to teach you know somebody who's never played before, who's you know fifteen or ten or or twenty. It's it's for you know, colleagues like us who have been in the game of life doing well, but kind of also getting beat up along the way. We got stress at home, stress at work. We find ourselves reaching for our phones in the evening. We might reach for wine or beer or chocolate and then the TV together. Like we might combine them. Yeah. And, and we've just, we might, we know that's not good for us, but you know, everybody's doing it. So no big deal. I don't have the time to get back into my instrument. Like all those kind of stories, that's my people. Yeah. And this program is designed specifically to give them the accountability they had when they were in private lessons and the community they had when they were in music class without the headache of learning. Is this something that I can have our educators and our broader community of, of people participate in? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And it's, it's an online portal and our main platform is going to be Facebook. We're going to have a private Facebook group. And the, the, basically it looked, it's like this, listen to music daily, play regularly, come into the Facebook group and share weekly. Every week uh, there's going to be an opportunity for someone through their own Facebook live to showcase something they're working on and mm. so that it creates like a virtual coffee shop open mic night right. without having to go and deal with that. And then go see live music monthly and like mm. get back into that rhythm because mm. we're, we, yeah. we're all into that rhythm at some point a lot more than we tend to get to. Yes. So yeah, it's going to be available. Uh, we're launching the program. I'm not sure when people will be listening to this, mm. um, but we're launching our founders launch is going to be uh, start, starts on January 27th mm. uh, and runs that week and then closes and then we'll open it back up. Uh, probably a, a few months after that, because we want to get a, a first cohort through up and running and kind of test it and get it, get it going before. Mm. But, but if this goes out in time, we can invite everybody to be a part of that founder's launch because that founder's launch, we're basically just cutting the tuition in half for the first brave souls that want to come in and get be a part of it right away. Mm. Okay, well, I'd love to make it uh, available to our community. And uh, I, I, I love what you're doing, Tim. You're awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and uh, thanks so much for your commitment to contribute music to the lives of others. I really yeah. appreciate it. 
right back at you. And uh, I, you know, our, our partnership in this world of healing others through music is, uh, yeah. is lifelong. So yeah. if anyone wants to learn more about it, they can also get my free relaxation music. If they want music to unwind to, they can just go to sonicrecovery.com. It's an easy place to plug in and, uh, and then find out. Where's the book available? Uh, on Amazon. Mm -hmm. And um, hold it up again. And let's yep. let's see it so everyone's clear about it. So Sonic Recovery, and it's Tim Ringgold. <clears throat> also, um, timringgold.com, right? Yep. And it's Tim Ringgold is R-I-N-G-G-O-L-D. It's ring, ring and gold, but it's all as one word, Ringgold. Thank you. Timringgold.com. Um, Tim Ringgold, thank you, man. Neil, thank you so much for having me. I really oh, appreciate it. Buddy. Thanks for all you, brother. Okay, I'll speak to you soon. Okay.